Peace and love, family. Welcome to another powerful, powerful discussion with the Read Book Club. That's right. This is a Read Book Club discussion, and we are discussing the myth and propaganda of Black buying power by Dr. Jared A. Ball. A few weeks ago, we discussed chapter one and two. Chapter one was an introduction, and chapter two was propaganda, was entitled Propaganda Versus Economics, Constructing a Myth. And we had some special guests with us. Uh, shout out to the Barter and Build Think Tank. They were here on the platform with us um, a few weeks back. I know that we haven't been here. I, I went out of town. I think I announced to you all that I was going out of town the following Sunday. And then the Sunday after that, I was working on a um, a proposal that I had to submit on Tuesday. So I just didn't have the time. But I'm back. We're back. And uh, we're ready to rock and roll. Brother T, go ahead and introduce yourself to the listening audience. Hello, family. How you doing? My name is Brother T. I'm as known as Brother Tiwolo. Um, definitely enjoying the book by um, Professor um, Dr. Jared Ball, The Myth of Propaganda, a Black Buying Power. Um, and looking forward to the discussion on the panel. Beautiful. So look, family, I remember the la the at the end of our conversation, the, the, the last time we met when we were talking about this book, I said, we're going to discuss uh, chapter three and chapter four. And then when I read chapter three today, I said, oh, no, we're not going to be able to discuss chapter three and chapter four, because chapter three was I don't want to say it was quite lengthy. It was, it was only 25 pages, but it was packed with a lot of information. And I'm just not one of those type of people, Brother T, that like to, to whisk over things. Yeah. I like to really like discuss and unpack some things, you know, and um, so I didn't want to cram everything into this um, one section. But this was a very, very powerful, um, powerful uh, a chapter. It's entitled Buying Power, Not Protest, The Myth Prevents Unrest. I'm going to repeat that again. The title mm. of this chapter is Buying Power, Not Protest, The Myth Prevents Unrest. And yeah. so earlier today, um, I text you, Brother T, I text you and Brother Everett, and I said, my major takeaways from, from this, and I was just going through re reading the 25 pages, and I said, the major takeaways um, from this section or chapter, chapter three, was one, he, he talks about or discusses the origin of the concept of buying or purchasing power. So we find out where that, that whole idea, where did it originate for and, and why? Like, what was the purpose of it? Where did it come from and why? So we learned that. Uh, in this particular chapter, he also then talks about, and let me see if Brother Everett can hear us now. He also then talks about uh, the history, uses, and impact of mass communication. And mm -hmm. we've been talking about, we've been having that conversation for years about how the media uh, manipulates public opinion. It, right. it manipulates us. And so he he really drives home, you know, the history, the history, uses. Okay, I guess, Brother Everett, you still can't hear us? He said he still can't try from your cell phone, brother Everett. Yeah. So just log, log out and maybe click the link and try from yourself. Well, I'll, I'll text him. I'll text him and ask him to try from his, from his cell phone. Um, and so he, okay. So he drives home the history or discusses the history uses and of impact of mass communications. And like I said, for years, we've talked about mass manipulation or media manipulation. I mean, right. we see that a lot, even with social media and how, you know, how social media they said has impacted and impacted the they said the ele the elections a lot of people yes. said it impacts the election it impacts race relations it impacts self esteem so we see how media impacts the masses um he also in this particular chapter talks about uh who started promoting black buying power and why and that was very eye opening and all i kept thinking when I was reading this brother T was that we got sold out like our own, you know, people always talk about the black boule, the black boule, mm -hmm. the black boule did sell us out. And mm -hmm. so he talks about that. And then he closes with, or ends the chapter by discussing how black buying power as a means of liberation made it into the black political consciousness. So Malcolm X quoted, you know, he talked about black buying power. So some of the people that we, that we hold in high regard, Mm -hmm. promoted this idea of black buying power and how we can use it as a tool for liberation. Uh, he closes with, he ends with talking about Baba uh, Amos Wilson. And, you know, I hold him in uh, very, very high regard. But yes. Dr. Amos Wilson, and you know, T, because you read the book, you know, we read it together in Blueprint for Black Power. 
um, that was an idea that Dr. Amos Wilson uh, presented, but he got it. It all goes back to a particular company that put that idea out there. We'll get to that during the discussion. But those were the major uh, takeaways for me. Um, Brother T, what, was, what were the major takeaways um, for you? You did a good job in breaking that this chapter down based off the points that you shared. One of the things I wanted to stress was that study of John, John H. Johnson. Um, that was the, the the person that we know from the Jet Ebony Magazine, Jet Magazine. We all know about the Jet Beauty of the Week. These things that was in this magazine that we all had in our households. Um, and and then the the one thing that was a shock, as you mentioned prior. It's that they use this in order to sell it to, to us in the, in, as, as the mass, this new dollar that was coming into the economy. So definitely want to stress that as we get to that and talk about that in, um, in this chapter. Beautiful. And so, brother, let's jump right in. We, you know, the first thing was the, you know, the first thing he addressed, first thing he discussed was the origin of the concept of buying power. And mm -hmm. he said that concept, and I'm on page 24, family, whoever has the book who may be following with, following along with me. Um, he says that the concept of buying power comes originally from government statistics generated by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's where it came from. And it says from the start, purchasing power or buying power was meant as a measurement of what workers could buy and a measurement by which leaders of business and government could work in unison to assure that workers' wages were low enough to assure maximum profit for ownership while sufficient enough to buy what was produced. So the whole of idea was trying to strike a balance, right? He says mm -hmm. right here, striking a balance. He said that would bring societal peace and equally important, uninterrupted proper function of business that was the whole idea of this concept so he talks about how you know uh decades following the i'm not decades following the social he talks about that da, 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 da. was it the civil war i'm trying to think where we talking about da, da, da. so this is 1884 i'm sorry mm -hmm. 1884, he says, impartial response to previous two decades, which has seen vast changes in the American economy and society. He says at this particular time that they were introducing this whole idea of black buying power, he says a truly national economy was developing, epitomized by but the transcontinental railroads. Industry was attracting increasing numbers of unskilled workers recruited from among immigrants, freedmen, women, and children into the urban centers. And with the emergence of the industrial worker, unemployment, slum conditions, and labor unrest were all on the rise. And so what the government was saying, okay, we see all of this stuff happening. We don't want societal unrest. We don't want to uprising. So what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, study. We're going to study this whole idea of buying power. We're going to try to strike a balance between what our workers make and, and what they can afford to buy, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that was the whole um, idea about it. And so Dr. Ball mentions that the first report was published in 1904. And he was saying at the beginning, people started questioning this idea. They were like, wait a minute. Hold up. Wait a minute. You're saying that we have the buying power of this, but then look at our conditions. Look at how mm -hmm. people are living. This can't be true. So we went from people who questioned that idea in 1904 to now no one questions it. They just say, hey, you know, black people have a buying power of $1.2 trillion and we just accept it as Bible. But we accept it as Bible we accept it as Bible because so many of the people that we hold in high regard has uttered it. So right. what is what are your thoughts on that, Brother T? Um, and I, I, want, I want to like make this point. I want to make a point and I want to show a, an example. Um, and I want to make sure I'm, I'm clear with it. Um, when it came down to understanding the business and also the partnership the business had with the government, they wanted to make sure that the wages where just to a point that the business made profit. I want to make this, this, this that point. The mm -hmm. business had to make profit, but it had to be a partnership between business and government, right? So 
it was it was a it was a comparison. So when people talk about buying power, like when our greats Malcolm X, I think the definition got switched, and that came along with how the government wanted to present it, and that and that's based off what you were saying. Now, today's example is starvation wages. That's what they had was getting paid. It wasn't getting paid enough to purchase what the business was selling. So it have to, I mean, when it comes down to purchasing power, it has to be a combination. And this is why it doesn't work the way some people talk about it today. It has to be a, a partnership between business and government because government has to make sure that they get their part based off of taxes. And also they work a partnership with the business, making sure it's low enough but the profit can come more into the business pockets, but it's 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 to a point that they don't have to raise the wages too much, so at least people can afford what they're they're selling. A perfect example is the way Walmart and McDonald's will work with the business. Walmart pays their employees just enough to live, and the partnership with the government is they allow their workers to have what living ex expenses and also food expense based off what the government gives some of their workers walmart and mcdonald's are two companies that hire the most federally funded empl employees so it's a partnership between business and a partnership between government and this is what um professor ball was talking about um basically in this chapter Mm -hmm. Brother Everett, peace to you, brother. Thanks for joining the panel. We can hear you now. That's why okay. I put you on meet real quick because I heard something, something. I don't know what it was, but I can, right. I, can, I hear you loud and clear now. What are your What are your thoughts on um, the origins of buying power? Not black buying power. We're going to get to that, but what the, the discussion um, concerning um, the origins of black? I'm sorry, the origins of buying power, uh -huh. purchasing power. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was um really a uh, um really interesting how they came up with it. And um, Brother T pretty much summed it up about how, you know, it was kind of a partnership, um, how the government would assess, you know, the process of the businesses and come up with the conclusion of how they would assume that the consumer would be able to afford to buy products and things like that. So, I mean, I guess in a way it's an interesting and probably something they thought they had to do to probably, you know, keep a control on society. But I mean, it's a little process. I think that could have worked in, um, could have worked probably in the benefit of um, customers, but it seems like it was more beneficial to, when I say customers, the, the, the working employer um, and consumers, but I think it worked more to the benefit of the businesses, you know, and the government. But thank you. Thank you for your input. And so, Brother T, you mentioned the, video by john h jackson i'm sorry john h johnson, johnson called, mm -hmm. yep called the selling the secret of selling the negro and dr ball called it a brilliant marketing video which in 1954 it says launched an updated approach to black business tradition of political struggle one focused on economics and not politics and with an emphasis on attracting white corporate advising I'm sorry, advertising money. So that, you know, they're saying that this was a brilliant video. So essentially this is a, a black man, John H. Johnson, who created a video, you know, trying to paint this picture like black folks have all this money. This is a, this is a, a, a you need to tap into this tap space, market. right? Tap into this market. But if you're not, you're missing out. And so in return, what, what, what was he trying to do? He was trying to get advertising money, That's people right. to pay him so that he could advertise to the black consumer. And Dr. Amos Wilson actually talks about that in Blueprint for Black, black Power, Power, how the black media was used, how the black media basically gives the white corp gives us gives the black audience over to the white corporations for money. He talks about that, how they basically sold out. And so what I want to do, brother T and brother Everett is at least just, you know, show the first maybe five minutes of this video. Mm. I'm looking online. It says the video is 21 minutes, 21 minutes and 22 seconds. 
We're mm-hmm. not going to pay 21 minutes of it. I'll drop the link in the chat. But I do want to I do want to uh, play at least the first five minutes so they'll know what we're talking about. All right. So let me share my screen. So this is the video. Wow. I Let me just. Uh, and let me mute everyone, including myself. Here we go. You got the level on that, Joe? Hey, how's this video coming through? All right, the light's hot enough. Don't forget the dolly is close. All right, be sure and stay clear at number two camera and all set. Stand by. <laughs> I'm Bob Trout. I've got a story here that I think is big, really big, because it's bound to have a terrific impact on business. I'm talking about a new market, a big new market, millions upon millions of new prospects with $15 billion to spend. That's right, I said $15 billion. That's a lot of money, isn't it? The surprising thing is that it's a fresh market, still full of opportunities. It grew up so fast, got so big in a hurry, but few of us realize its scope. Now these days, nobody's likely to pass up chances to sell. And yet right here in our own front yard, there's a neglected market. There's money waiting to be spent. To get the story of this market, to be able to tell you the secret of selling the Negro, we did a lot of digging. We talked to leading businessmen, the customers and the salesmen. We went to Washington, D.C. We set up cameras and other key points around the nation. And out of this all, there emerged a story. The story of a new market. Yes, this is the market we're talking about. The new Negro family. Their name is Wells or Wilson, Smith or Brown or Alexander or Breed. They live in Chicago, in Atlanta or New York. In Detroit, St. Louis, Los Angeles, any one of a thousand cities and towns. All over the country, families such as this are enjoying new prosperity. They have new interests, new standards of living, a buying power they've never enjoyed before. They're good prospects for practically all types of goods and services. All too often, though, they're overlooked prospects. Why? Because of some good, valid reason? No. They're overlooked because of mistaken ideas, because of -of out-of-date ideas about how the Negro lives and how he buys. The truth of the matter is that the Negro lives pretty much the same as other folks. He buys pretty much the same way, too. But just the same, a lot of old doubts and opinions keep cropping up over and over again. I don't like to do business with Negroes. They're drifters. You can't keep track of them. 
Yes, although a lot of people think that way, the truth is that one out of every three Negro families living in cities today owns its own home. That figure comes directly from the United States Bureau of Census. Uh, maybe so, but Negroes are poor credit risks. Not more of a credit risk than any other group. Actually, the Negro home buyer meets his payments faithfully, often more faithfully than other race groups in the same economic level. That's the information we got from people who ought to know, the National Association of Real Estate Boards. Well, maybe, but I've always heard that Negroes buy shoddy, poor-quality merchandise. No, it's just the other way around. According to leading researchers, in proportion to population and income, Negroes buy more quality products than any other comparable United States group. You see, there are a lot of confused notions about the Negro customer. But when you dig right down and find out about them, they just don't hold water. Negroes own homes. They meet their payments faithfully. They buy good brands of merchandise. So why let a lot of old-fashioned ideas hurt profits? Take a look at the real facts. Here in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, some amazing facts and figures about this new market have been uncovered. For a first-hand report, we would like to take you directly to the United States Department of Commerce to hear this story from the Secretary of Commerce himself. Here is the Honorable Sinclair Weeks, the Secretary of Commerce of the United States. Okay, so I want to stop it there. I, I'm sitting here. It's, it's kind of like when you are a student of history and you knew what the hell was going on in 1954. Mm -hmm. You would laugh at this commercial. You know, so you mean to tell me, you know, when you look at a, you said this, this group of folks who were locked out, right, of creating wealth, all of a sudden in 1940, 1954, this group of people, they're just doing well. We own a house. We we own a car. We're buying automobiles. And, and I'm not saying that no, you know, that there weren't black people who live like that. That's not what I'm saying. But to say collectively, to sell the idea that collectively we were living like that. Mm -hmm. a, a student of history know that that's hogwash that 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 collectively we weren't we weren't living like that i mean 1954 my mother was born in 1952 you know a lot of those boomers were born in like the 40s and the you know the 50s and so the boomers to tell you how bad they had it the boomers were actually the first or the first generation who graduated from high school went to college got good jobs so you mean to tell me you're saying that my grandmother Right. In 1954 was living like that. And they, we weren't. As a matter of fact, we were like in the middle of the, the Great Migration. The Great Migration took place from 1970 to 19, 1917. I'm sorry. 1917 to 1970. And so mm -hmm. we were kind of like in the middle of the Great Migration. Black people were leaving out of the South, South. And they, they were looking for, you know, employment and better you know the isabel wickerson calls it the warmth of other sons but looking for other opportunities mm. so they so you know i mean i oh my goodness for johnson to sell this idea to you the white folks that we were just living like them and buying automobiles and cars and going shopping it's 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 bananas it's it's, it's ridiculous brother t what, what do you have to say brother well this here is is based off a study and one thing that they talked about was the Department of Commerce. You understand after 1921, we had the Tulsa, Oklahoma riots. We had riots prior. After that, 1923, 1924, they start studying Negro businesses in the Negro economy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Basically our, our jobs. Now understand up for 30 years, our, the president of the World War II was Truman. Okay, Truman, as we talked about in our last um, chapter one, when we mentioned how few blacks, when World War II finished, had any defense contracts. Well, basically, it came from this study. And the reason why not many blacks had contracts, because not many schools had the studies needed in order for people to be adequate. OK, so once World War Two was done. Remember what came from the post World War Two era. FHA loans. Yep. Federal and housing. also the ability to go to school. Right. Which is called what? The Pell Grant. 
Mm-hmm. So they had to sell the idea. Remember, because most blacks who came back from the world, World War II, couldn't receive the benefits because they were restricted based off what state they were in. They had to start going north. And what they did promise them were jobs. So they had to create this. Remember what year this was, 1954. This is after World War II. What was being pushed? Up with mobility. So thus, who wanted to make sure they had the dollars in order to make their magazine flourish? John H. Johnson. Mm. Now, it's a shame because one of the things that that wow. that dissolved his um, magazine was not getting enough funding from the Department of Defense. That's one of the things. He wasn't getting the marketing dollars he'd once gotten. And one of the things that mm. authors talked about was that that's the reason one of the ways his magazine fell because the marketing dollars wasn't there. So the way he sold this out was the way that the caused his demise as well. Wow. I never knew that. Woo, brother T. You said the way he sold us out, it came right back around. It boomeranged. Came around, mm. It came back around. And so it says, you know, Dr. Ball says here that the Johnson Media product meant again only to wed corporations and advertisers with black consumers. And he did a wonderful job for that. He did a he did a wonderful job. And in fact, after he did it, Black media companies like your Radio One, he talked about that. Radio One, mm-hmm. Kathy Hughes, um, Tom joined a morning show. All they did was continue what he started, and that is to sell us out to white corporations. Right. Brother Everett, did you want to chime in? Um, man, I'm glad you played that video. I actually saw that video a while ago, and um, I never looked at it or applied it to the book until i read that part i was kind of looking at it the video kind of pissed me off because it was kind of like marketing how to sell to black people it was stereotyping it so i i never looked at it any other kind of way but after reading the book you know because i was kind of like man i'm not i'm not going in the direction what you're saying black shit you know it's got to be black buying power in there but he touched on something that just threw me off with this video how they were marketing to us and how they were selling the consumers pretty much and how he the johnson johnson was benefiting and uh the fact that i didn't even know that he was a uh that a brother did the film i didn't know that so that really threw me off and now i'm getting the history of how he benefited from that video i'm looking at the video completely different now than i did before i was looking at it as a way of black people looking at the tendencies seeing how they they selling to us and you know hey they they you know they conning us this or that i never looked at it as a, in terms of him selling a, a ideology of black buying power Absolutely. and so now now i'm i'm really kind of more leaning into the book that was the one that hit me now right I'm, I'm you know that got me deep into it that was powerful yeah i never absolutely. looked at it that way absolutely and sister sister crystal she said you know don't forget bt right BT, right. you know, Robert Johnson, same, same thing, you know, same BT, thing. like you said, that BT falls right under that umbrella, but now they're owned by Viacom. So they own by white folks now anyway. Right. Mm-hmm. So now it's white folks doing business with white folks and using black celebrity faces to promote certain things to us. And, and we're going to get into how black celebrities are, are, are utilized or are, I'm sorry, not are used to promote ideas. Um, and he talked about Dr. Ball talked about that as well. Brother T, did you want to interject? Did you want to say when, something else. when we talk about radio, we talk about Kathy Hughes. We talk about um, what um, John H. Johnson did as well with B with um, with Jet Magazine mm-hmm. and also Essence. Um, we have to remember what Tom Joyner did. Um, the reason why he was so um, an important role in the black community because he always pushed um, funding to HBCUs, um, and we now we can recognize what's going on right now. So how strong radio was. Um, at that time, and radio still is strong, but back when black radio was important because they had a large demographic that was pushing it, they needed Tom Joyner. They needed him. So that funding for HBCUs was important. He produced a lot of money 
um, for HBCUs. As we know, the Tom Joyner um, cruise that happened every year, all the vacation spots he pushed at HBCUs. Now that they don't need radio, they don't need black radio, you see how the funding has just decreased. Absolutely. Where, where are the, the magazines? They're not ran by blacks like that anymore. There's no more John H. Johnson's. There's no more Tom Joyner's that's pushing. So they don't need the black uh, put into put into black um, platforms. So you see now what happened um, with this administration. They had reduced um, the money going to HBCUs by billions of dollars. So you see how when the pup, sorry, when the platforms are not there, the funding cease. <laughs> oh, no, you did that. You. <laughs> Can I say the puppets? When the, when the puppets, I mean the platforms. You said when they only no longer need the puppets. I mean the platforms. Platforms. Then, then we stop. Then we stop funding the money there that way. Go. But I couldn't agree with you more. And so I love how Dr. Ball then moves the discussion. Well, no, since we're still talking about media, I do want to get into. Because oh, I'm thinking about page 35 where he talks about the use of celebrities yes. and how you know through the media. Uh, after you know World War II, the United States wanted to promote this idea that we're over here living in harmony. Black and white folks are living in harmony. Black people are doing better because they were pushing capitalism and democracy and trying to impose capitalism and democracy on the rest of the world. And the rest of the world was saying, wait a minute, how are you coming over here trying to sell me on democracy? Because the rest of the world was leaning towards Marxism and communism. And so they said, well, wait a minute, how are you going to push that on me how are you going to push democracy and capitalism on me? And it's not even working in your own company. I mean, your own country. Look mm -hmm. at how the Negroes, look at the race relations between the Negroes. And so the white folks, let me see what it says right here now. Hold on. I'm on the t at the top of page 35. It says right here, uh, the problem of race relations in America was much exploited by Soviet propaganda and left many Europeans uneasy about America's ability to practice democracy mm -hmm. she now claimed to be offering the world. It was therefore reason that the exporting of African Americans to perform in Europe would dispel such damaging perceptions. An American military government reports. Wait a minute. Look, mm. how, deep the mo look how deep the rabbit hole goes. <laughs> An American wow. military government report of March 1947 revealed plans to have top, and this is in quotes, top have, to have top rank American Negro vocalists give concerts in Germany. Marian Anderson or Dorothy Man Manor appearances before German, German audiences would be of great importance. The promotion of black artists was to become an urgent priority for American cultural cold warriors. Down the bottom, he talks about this. He talked about how films, right? How the, they, this is the government I'm talking to now. It says films, according to a memo, okay, a 1943 memo from mm -hmm. the OSS. And what does the acronym stand for? I don't like to give acronyms without giving. Where's the OSS? What did the OSS stand for, Brother what, T? What page um, are we on? Again? I'm on page 35. Okay, OSS, the yeah, Office of the Office of Strategic Services. Yeah, gotcha. So the Office of Strategic Services wrote a memo in 19... Uh, 1943, and they were the predecessor of the CIA. Mm -hmm. I think it says in wartime predecessor to, yeah, I think they were the pre predecessor to the OS. The OSS was the predecessor to the yeah. CIA. It was okay. a, a, the, the National Security Act of, of the CIA. Yes, you're right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so they wrote in a memo, it says that films, according to the memo, are among the most powerful propaganda weapons at the disposal of the United States and a potent force in attitude formation that can be employed on most of the major psychological warfare fronts. So people think that when in the, in the community, when we talk about psychological warfare, that we're just making this stuff up. No, this mm -hmm. stuff is real. This is government. This is a report from the government saying that they've realized how how powerful uh, films are and how they can be weaponized. So it says right here they can be employed on most of the major psychological warfare fronts, including the domestic civilian and military population. One function directed domestically towards black America was to promote an illusion of inclusion, a tactic suited perfectly to Johnson the black commercial class 
and to the concept of buying power. So it says right here in the report that was dated on January the 24th, 1953, it says concentrated on the problem of black stereotyping in Hollywood under the heading Negroes in pictures. It says Alsop reported that he had secured the agreement of several casting directors to plant well-dressed Negroes as a part of the American scene without appearing too conspicuous and deliberate. Sangaree, which is shooting, doesn't permit this kind of planting, unfortunately, because the period, the picture is the picture is period and laid in the South. It will consequently show plantation Negroes. However, this is being offset to a certain degree by planting a dignified Negro butler in one of the principal's homes and by giving him dialogue indicating he is a free man and can work wherever he work where he likes. And so we have to understand, you know, I mean, brother, ever did that, did that kind of blow you? So yeah. they say even this whole illusion, you know, how we say we included mm -hmm. they, they strategically put these people in front of us to promote certain ideas. And they're right. still and they're still doing it. They mm -hmm. was doing it then, and they're still doing it now. Can you can you imagine? This is what the impact of Muhammad Ali, brother Cassius Clay, before he, before he became a Muhammad Ali. This is the impact because this is when they was puppeteering and putting black entertainers during that time frame. Elvis Presley's they he went into the military, maybe he went to the army. It made it made him look good to 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 be rock and roll's newest thing, music's biggest. And, and um, Hollywood's biggest um, entertainer to go to the military. To use fast forward to the years that um, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali denounced it and said, "Hey, I'm not going there. No one in Vietnam called me the N word." So this this is an important because he said, "I'm not going to that status quo. I'm not going there to kill. I'm not going to show that that there's no unity. You still treat us bad here." Mm -hmm. This is the importance of him standing up. Not just the fact that he didn't want to go in, but to say that I'm not going to put that false image to the world. You're still treating us as subhuman. Facts. Mm. Powerful, Brother T. Powerful. Brother Everett, did you want to jump in? Or we... No, he pretty much summed it up. I mean, I'm just still like kind of disgusted how, you know, it just goes back to that film and how they strategically use in the video and marketing. It falls right down into what everything we do now, getting the kids, the hip hop music, the videos, it goes further now. So they put into the music, you know what I mean? And how they can manipulate a mind. So it's strategically, he got the proof there. That's all I can say. Yeah, he does. He he does. I mean, he's, he's backing up everything that he's claiming. I mean, at this point, I don't have anything to refute. And I know Brother Jabari and I, we were here, we were talking out trash. Well, I, he was talking trash. I was just interviewing him and talking a little trash with him. But I mean, this book is phenomenal. It was an eye opener. Um, I feel like Dr. Ball, he definitely did his homework, homework on this. Um, I do want to kind of piggyback to page 30, where he mentions Edward Bernays. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how post-war, so at the World War II, there was a um there was a, a need re to rebrand the concepts of yep, con capitalism and democracy. Um, it says that he, you know, they wanted to put this idea or sell this idea that shopping meant being free and being free meant shopping. Mm -hmm. And so Bernays thought that the elite should be able to manipulate the masses. Uh, into feeding the economy with their many purchases. And so he pushed, it says he pushed, he pushed and pushed for media to be, to be, or for propaganda, should I say, he argued that propaganda should be incorporated into every facet of society from mm -hmm. education to politics, arts, sciences, to social service. He says the more freedom democracy promised, the more propaganda was necessary to assure that freedom be defined along carefully described parameters. I mean, yeah. T, when I, I mean, I, but we're not surprised. And so, you know, Nilly Fuller always said that you find <laughs> racism, white supremacy in all, you, you're all there. areas of activity. All areas of activity. <laughs> yes. And so you find it I'll there. Think well, about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you find it there. Well, why do you find it there? The, because the propaganda that's there. Right. I mean, like, you know, the propaganda that's being pushed. So you do find it in all areas of human activity. That's right. You know, and so, Brother T, did you want to go into that? No, no, keep, keep, keep on because this, remember, this is um the nephew of the crazed and um, 
sex addict and um, drug addict, um, um, Sigmund Freud. Remember, this really? is nothing. I didn't know that. I didn't see that. I didn't know. It. Yeah, I didn't know that. It says it says here, um, public relations. Oh, yes, um, yes, yes, it does. Right? Yeah, yep. Yeah. yep. You see here, it says the nephew, the, um, his position as a leading corporate marketer and nephew to the Sigmund Freud situated him perfectly as one interested in his uncle's study of mass psychology to use the research to manipulate people into becoming good consumers. You know, he said, let's remove them from logic and have them to focus on emotion. So remember this, diamonds are a girl's best friend. Remember, diamonds are worthless rocks. But in order to sell it to the masses and to make sure it can be something for engagements and marriage, teach, diamonds teach, teach. have to be the girl's best friend. You know what I'm saying? And you got to give the diamond to the lady or you're going to be <laughs> outed. <laughs> and so this mass psychology had to happen. And this is what this, this is how they use professionals. So not just our entertainers, our sportsmen, our mark, our businessmen, everybody worked side by side the government in order to make this stuff happen. Mm. Oh my he was goodness, he I'm... was the one that um what was he saying? He wanted to uh his philosophy on bond power was to have the money belong to the elite, which would be a small amount. And um, dictate to the majority, which would be the poor. I'm yes. kind of paraphrasing, right? But okay. mm-hmm. that's right. I mean, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm glad you went back to that because that's an important point. How yeah. they use psychology in order to change the marketing. So it, it helped out Johnson because now Johnson know how to market and to to get advertisers as his magazine, which he partnered with the government in order to infuse and take money out of communities. And to, and, to, and to promote this bourgeoisie and our and our and, and and also he didn't he didn't show too if you think about if you think about Essence and Jet magazine you didn't see much disorder in that magazine you saw the best black ex- excellence you never saw much about I, I can't remember seeing the slums in every mm-hmm. city you always seen the best dress business who was getting married who was infl- influential in each of the cities and towns you never saw them talk about things that could help the downtrodden that's true now that you mention it i never paid that any attention but mm. have you yeah. ever seen it in old magazine either i'm sorry no that's a fact you never <laughs> i'm not doing this is what you see <laughs> i heard about meditating and breathing and Writing on my vision board. I'm sorry. No, but you but you're right. They never showed that they don't they never showed that element. They never show oh, that okay. side. You know what I mean? And so I love I'm at the bottom of page 31. He says the conscious and intelligent manipulation of organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in de- democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute, I'm sorry, constitute. An invisible government. Let me say that again because I butchered it. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. So whoever controls the media controls you. Simple as that. Dr. Lennox Jeffries talked about it. Dr. Amos Wilson talked about it. Anthony T. Browder talks about it. Whoever controls the media controls you. They control the way you think. They control your self-esteem. They control what you feel. So he talks about that. And it says that um, this other quote at the top of page 32, it says the media by which special pleaders transmit their messages to the public through propaganda include all the means by which people today transmit their ideas to one another. This is no means of human communication, which may not also be a means of deliberate propaganda, because propaganda is simply the establishing of a reciprocal understanding between an individual and a group. So, mm. I mean, it's, it's I mean, we see it when I when we were just discussing how um we're manipulated by the media. I thought about social media and how they hire. It said that Facebook hires attention engineers. So oh, they're, they're, they're psychologists on the staff. There are attention engineers. So people trying to figure out how to keep your attention 
while you're on these apps, because the longer you're on these apps, the longer I can advertise to you. Right. Mm -hmm. Data engineers, I'm sure, too. Yeah, data engineers, attention engineers, psychologists. I remember when the iPhone dropped, the guy Steve Jobs told people, he said, I wouldn't give my, uh, I'm not going to give my, I wouldn't give an iPhone to my child. And this is the guy that produced yeah, it. it. That's right. Mm -hmm. So if the guy that produces it say, I wouldn't give it to my child, why would we give it to ours? Mm. I mean, so anyway, moving forward, let's, let's, I know we only have about 15 more minutes. Um, page 38. I'm on page 38 now where he talks about how after that marketing video uh, that, that Johnson produced, people started buying into this whole idea of black buying power. Black people have money. First, it was 15 billion. Then it just kept going up, going up, going up. And today we say that black people have a, a, a buying power of one point two trillion dollars. And so we see he's showing us Dr. Ball, I think from page uh, 38 all the way to page 40 he's telling us he said Malcolm X quoted it right Malcolm X talked about oh we have 20 you we have spending power of 20 billion dollars a year mm -hmm. he says he says that another leader by the name of Danny Grant uh, he was a, a part of the Baltimore core he's a Baltimore core leader it says that in 1968 you know he mentioned oh we got 25 billion dollars worth of, of buying power right mm -hmm. and so then he goes on to mention Dr. King and he said, Dr. King was like, well, wait a minute. And that's, I mean, Dr. King, I'm telling you, when I read his writings, he was really beyond his time. Like he yeah. was, he was, he was light years, you know, ahead of his time. Dr. King said this, and I thought that this was very powerful because while everybody in the black power movements was saying, well, we have a buying power of 25 billion, 20 billion. All we need to do is pull our resources together and we'll be fine. Dr. King said, mm, not exactly. Right. And, he, and he goes on to say, he, it says at the end of this, his life, he made this statement in 1968. He says, just as the Negro cannot achieve political power in isolation, he says, neither can he gain economic power through separatism. While there must be a continued emphasis on the need for blacks to pull their economic resources and withdraw consumer support from disc discriminating firms, we must not be oblivious to the fact that the larger economic problems confronting the Negro community will only be solved by federal programs involving billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. He says one unfortunate thing about black power is that it gives priority to race precisely at a time when the impact of automation and other forces have made the economic question fundamental for blacks and whites alike. In this context, a slogan, power for poor people, would be more appropriate than the slogan, power, I'm sorry, black power. King goes on. He says, in short, the Negro's problem cannot be solved unless the whole of American society takes mm -hmm. a new turn toward greater economic justice. In a multiracial society, no group can make it alone. It is a myth to believe that the Irish, the Italians, and the Jews, the ethnic groups that Black power advocates cite as justification for their views, rose to power through separatism. It is true that they stuck together, but their group unity was always enlarged by joining in alliances with other groups such as political machines and mm -hmm. trade un unions to succeed in a pluralist pluralistic society and an often hostile one at that the negro obviously needs organized strength but that strength will only be effective when it is consolidated through constructive alliances with the majority group Oh my gosh, brother T. What do you have to say about that, brother? Well, you know, we have to understand exactly how our leaders were sold this idea. Once again, we've seen the importance of the government and how that, that definition has been ch challenged. After the Nixon administration, he's the one that sold us that that the um the, the calm us down um black business. He sold that ideal. We rem remember. Mm -hmm. Then the president after him, his um um Gerald Ford, the next president, his vice president. I'm listening. I'm listening to you. Gerald Ford came around and sold business. So this whole thought pattern from that Nixon administration to the Ford administration kept on spilling out business, business. 
and it kind of gave people a miss um understanding of exactly this thing so but but one thing that um martin luther you know king um dr king focused on was the econ economy economic aspect he, he said that he, he he guided his people into a burning burning building, building yeah and then you know what use is having them to eat at the table i mean to sit at the table if they can't afford the meal so that was the last part and this is what um byron allen was talking about some a couple of years ago when he says hey when he talked to Coretta scott king they said they killed my my martin because he wanted that fourth part of that, that movement, which is the economic. Um, so he, he was waking it up to what needed to be done, building that economic inclusion, that 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 18, um, I think 66 law, the first law that um, that uh, included us in the infrastructure of the economy. That's what he was fighting for. Yeah, and mm. so, yeah, exactly. The, the redistribution of resources and wealth. That's what he was calling for. And mm -hmm. like you said, Brother T, and you can only do that through public policy. Do policy. Mm -hmm. That That's it. Brother Everett, did you want to chime in? I was just thinking, I was thinking about um, Powernomics when he mentioned um, billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And I just started thinking, like Dr. Claude was saying, reparations. And he also mentioned, um, like Brother T was saying, um, he was saying about um government programs but you know it just makes you um more aware that they were on point and like brother t said Mar um, martin started understanding the economic value a little bit more um for for our community he started tapping into that and his, his views changed a little bit that's and that's when they probably that's when a lot of people say that's what got him killed not the um you know we shall overcome in the marching he started identifying that economic uh, proud was that we, our community needed to understand. So that, that's a very important part as well that he put in there mentioning, um, especially quoting him of what he was saying. Mm -hmm. I never even knew he said that about uh, programs and reparations kind of. I, I never knew he had that uh, um, that ideology. Especially when he talk, started talking about the land grabs and how that benefited and how he said we're going to D.C. to get our check. That's around that's that same um, speech that he talked about how government programs assisted um, um, whites and, and people who are immigrants. Um, and that's one thing that I think we'll learn more when we check out the book um, when affirmative action was white. Mm. Mm. So that's one of our we're going to put that on one of our on our list when affirmative action was white. That's how that's how gotta do that. And so, brother T, could you expound um while we actually we're getting ready to close, but could you expound on how Nixon rebranded black power? You mind expounding on that? Because that's well, one thing that we didn't touch on. You mentioned Nixon, but I, I I forgot to touch on it. Yes, let's um slightly go back to um page 32 and I'll I'll, I'll read here. Um um, allow me to find this. Okay, I had it out. Well, let's. I can. I can go by memory. I can go by memory, but I, I'd rather not. But anyway, Richard Nixon during during that time frame, um, the Black Power movement was was strong. We had um, we had the Panthers, um, and they were and a lot of unrest after the the killing of um, um Martin Luther King. One thing that he wanted to quiet down was um, black power movement. So what he suggested, and you, we read this in um, a, a previous book um, about let's start giving them something, but we're going to give them black capitalism, but we're not going to give them the funding. You'll find this about the, in the color of money when we read that book as well. She talks about um, Nixon gave this this program of black capitalism. This is sell them on business, but it, one of the one of the advisors were, was saying, "Well, what about funding? No, no, no. We don't give them that. We just gonna give them. We gonna sell the idea of black capitalism. Just that you know, it's good to have black business. That's gonna be the new black power. We're gonna move them from up unrest." And just give them this idea of black capitalism that now we can just start a business and we'll start. And this is when all I think that's when I believe all this uh, misunderstanding came from, from 
people still going with um, how business actually works and we don't need the government. That's what they wanted them to push. You don't need the government for funding. Let's do it all for ourselves. Because as we talked about in this chapter, all businesses have a partnership with who? The government. The government. Thank you. But what was black capitalism saying? We don't need what? The government. We don't Thank need. You. We can do it on our own. We can so just re, we can you, circulate. So, the so do you see how things switch? So they wanted the idea of people doing it by themselves. One thing I find out is that blacks are the only people in society that are asked to be stoic. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Blacks are the only people in society asked to be stoic, just to tough it out, just to be unfazed by what's going on. Let's just do it by ourselves. Don't show no emotion. Just put your head down and just keep pounding. I don't need nobody's help. As we've seen, immigrants, as Dr. King was saying, immigrants, whites, people in the society all use the, the benefits of the government. They even changed the definition of generational wealth. Generational wealth is not just beating the business and handing money down. Generational wealth, when it comes down to whites, you know what it is? Tax advantages. Mm. Ways to hide their money to get tax advantages. That's generational wealth. That's why you hear these rich billionaires saying, I don't leave my children money. But what they do do is have custodial IRAs and, and, and other places to hide their money. Why? Because they don't want to pay federal taxes. So they mm. even changed our definition on what generational wealth is. They sold us the, the, the black buying power myth, and then now they sell us generational wealth. And, they, and what we keep on saying, we don't need the government. Those whites and them immigrants are using what? Tax advantages in order to save their money. And yeah. one thing, we're still being duped because you got our puppet heads, our puppet masters out there saying we don't need it. Mm. Our superstars, our Jay Z's, just go ahead and buy some art and flip it. Go do this. It's a whole bunch of stuff <laughs> that they don't understand. They're not not knowing that buying of the art is a way that they hide money as well. See, it's, it's so many games that we're not being allowed to play fairly. They leave some pieces off the board. That's right. Mm. That's right. Mm. T, that was. I mean, that was powerful. T, yeah. that was powerful. And I'm going to drop the link in the chat to uh, the book we're reading, The Myth of uh, Black Buying Power. This is a PDF. It's a free PDF that Dr. Gerald is is offering. It's on his website. Hold it up. Hold it up, Brother Everett. Do you have your book? You know it. It's on, it's on the website, family. It's on his website. The name of his website is called imixwhatilike.org. And so on that website, he's offering a free copy of his PDF of, of his book, a PDF of his book, The Myth and, and Propaganda of Black Buying Power. And, um, and so family, I mean, go ahead and download the book, you know, read it, catch up with us, go back. We only had one discussion on this. This is literally our second discussion uh, today. But go in and read it and, and, and join us. Uh, Brother T, Brother Everett, do you have any closing words? Um, no, I was just going to um, just say it's just a deep book. Um, he also talked about Nixon and uh, minority business, entrepreneurship thing, entre 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 mm, enterprise, and how uh, how they wanted to show that we needed the government in a certain amount of way that we did we couldn't do it on our own, and that's why they created that program. So just to piggyback off, brother T, yeah, this after that he mentioned that movie, I'm just shook a little bit. That messed me up because I saw that movie when I, I went and researched, it and I was like. Damn, that's the movie. And it, it just, this is a deep book. Everybody needs to get this book. It's a deep book. Absolutely. Brother T, you have any closing words, brother? They love you in the chat. They said, brother, you better look. <laughs> Sister Crystal Denise, she said, speak that truth, brother. And Sister Jasmine said, y'all better tell the truth. So they, yeah, I mean, T, I mean, you've been just dropping bomb at the bomb at the bomb tonight. I mean, I, I even expounding beyond what was written in here. And I, I appreciate all of your, your knowledge, just your input. But do you have any closing words, Brother T? Um, we shared this on our last, um, our last viewing, on the last chapter, chapter one. And everyone asks us for solutions. And I, even I know many people ask um, Professor um, Jared Ball for solutions. 
And one thing I like to say that in, solutions won't come until we dispel these myths. Mm. We cannot come to a solution until we stop believing the lie. Because we've been acting upon the lie for so long that a solution is always going to be hit. Facts. Mm, facts. So thank you so much, family, for tuning in. We'll be back next week. Next week, we're going to discuss. Let me look at the page number, Brother T. Let me see. You know next page number. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look, look, look. So next next week, I don't I don't want to say uh 53 to 63 or you know, or 63 to 94. Mm. Cause that's 28 pages. So that's just a discussion in itself. So yeah, we'll, um, we'll go ahead and discuss, uh, you know, uh, chapter four, uh, next week, the myths, modern purveyors reviewing Saling and Nielsen, because that's the Nielsen report. People talk mm -hmm. about the Nielsen report. They talk about Saling and that's where they're getting the, 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 the information or the data to support their idea as to why we have the uh, buy power of $1.2 trillion. They're getting it from Saling and the, the Nielsen report. And so uh, he's going to, I guess, Dr. Uh, Bald is going to discuss, you know, the error, I guess, in their, their uh, methodologies. And so I look forward to reading chapter four. Thank you all for tuning in. This was a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Um, Sister Jasmine Martin, she said, our environment won't change until we change our minds. Ashe, 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 Ashe. Donnie Williams, this brother said, white folks made a science out of marketing to us. Indeed, yes. this is why I don't follow trends. I do the opposite. I appreciate it, I, I, brother. You're so right. A beautiful mind, peace and love to you, sister. She said, beautiful, Bill. Thank you so much. Sister Crystal Denise. Sister Crystal, you need to join. She's, <laughs> and you get the chat. And she is a, this is a powerful sister. She just got awarded um, the Fancy Lou Hamer Award Whoa. Um, for, for her work. Yeah, mm -hmm. this sister, congratulations to you, Sister Crystal Denise. I saw it on Facebook. Congratulations, congratulations to you, Queen. Keep up the yeah. good work. She's doing a lot of powerful work, but I want to get you on this panel. So I don't know if she's at work or if, you know, Sunday she's just saying that may be her day to relax. But, sis, I need you on this panel, okay? You're a powerful sister, and thank you so much for, for joining in and giving us your input. Peace to you, Brother Jai. Peace to you, Brother Jai. All right, family, we'll be back here at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, next Sunday. Peace and black power.